Good evening. Welcome to the British Library. My name is John. I look after the events program here at the British Library. It's been an absolute pleasure to put together tonight's celebration of Tales of the Weird, which uh, didn't need much uh, thought for the title because it was already a wonderful title of the acclaimed and super successful series of anthologies from the British Library publishing Tales of the Weird itself, uh, which you'll be hearing plenty of tonight. It's also uh, a great context. We have next door in the main building an exhibition called Fantasy Realms of Imagination, uh, which is a survey of, of course, books, rare manuscripts, Mervyn P, Lewis Carroll, Beowulf, right up to present day uh, fantasy writers. It's got games, it's got costumes, it's got films. So if you like fantasy and that sort of thing, please do have a look at that. But of course, Tales of the Weird are not just fantasy, there are many other things besides. Um, we're absolutely delighted to have a great panel for you tonight. First part of the evening, uh, you'll be hearing from my colleague Tanya Kirk and Johnny Davidson, and our guest tonight, uh, Zara Louise Stubbs, talking about how the uh, Tales of the Weird anthologies are put together. And in the second half of the uh, evening, you'll be hearing from Julia Armfield, the, uh, the, the writer novelist, and tonight's uh, special addition to the bill, uh, Matthew Holness, who is uh, taking a night off from his tour, tour following his, um, his alter ego and friend, um, Garth Marenghi, around the country to town hall venues and arenas um, tonight and he's taken the time out to join us in the place of Reese Smith, Shearsmith, who sadly couldn't be with us tonight. It's a bit mysterious. <laughs> and sends his apologies to you all. Welcome also to everybody watching online um, around the world tonight. It's great to have you with us too. Our chair for tonight is the incredible Matthew Sweets. Many of you will know him from his uh, several programmes on Radio 3 and 4, including Free Thinking. Um, he's also a writer. His most recent book is Operation Chaos, which I think really relates to uh, not very uh, ghostly things, but, well, maybe you could correct me there, uh, from, the, this is from the Vietnam War. Um, so he's, a, he's also a great aficionado of, of the weird and the strange in literature, so you're in good hands. That is it for me. Please enjoy the event. And before I go, there's a fantastic bookstore outside. And for watching online, you can visit the books tab at the top of the page. See you later. <laughs> Thank you very much, John. We're going to have a weird night, I think, a weird 90 minutes. You might be a weird audience. I'm not sure. The lights are shining me out, so I can't actually tell how weird you are. But I hope slightly weird, because it's weirdness that has brought us here, our mutual love of weird fiction, strange fiction. We might even decide what that is tonight. I remember an advert in the 80s where, where Lenny Henry said that uh, square crisps were weird. I don't think square crisps are that weird. I think if we read the fiction that's anthologised here, we will think of weird things like whistling rooms containing silent dogs, wicked fleas, that kind of thing, ghosts that pull on the ropes of mountaineers. Dirty dishes, too, can carry a kind of weirdness. Things that crawl and burrow. Things that... Suitcases that seem to have bats inside. This is the sort of ground that we're going to occupy tonight. And I'm, I'm introducing you now to the, to the British Library's anthologists, people who are dragging these stories from uh, the dusty <coughs> cupboards and the odd byways of uh, often periodical literature back into the light. So Tanya Kirk is sitting next to me here. She's lead curator of printed heritage collections, 1601 to 1900. That's a big period to cover. She's also the lead curator of the exhibition uh, Across the Road There, Fantasy, which I'll, I'd strongly recommend to you. And she's the editor of several of the, of the collections of, uh, of weird anthologies that are stacked here. Johnny Davidson is the man who's sort of, you're the weird supremo, really. That's what I'm going to call you. <laughs> He's the, you're where the weird book stops, aren't you, I guess. <laughs> Um, and uh, uh, Zara Louise Stubbs um, is a, an academic uh, PhD student, and she is the or she is the editor of the Uncanny Gastronomic, the Edible Weird, um, which is uh, which is one of the most recent collections of stories. Um, so um, do we have to perhaps decide the grounds, the the, the limits of this this genre, the weird. Uh, Johnny, maybe you're the person to start us off with this. Can we kind of find the origins or the edges of this idea? What does it mean? Well, for our series, it, it's become quite a, a broad umbrella of the weird. Um, so when we first started it, we chose that word particularly because it was a bit fuzzier than some of the other uh, generic terms. Um, 
So our series includes gothic, uh, elements of horror, things that are supernatural, things that are just macabre but not supernatural. Mm. Um, kind of like you uh, introduced it with, so it's like a list of all these. Well, you said, kind of like me. Yeah, I thought you like meant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, something to do. With, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we've actually our series is sort of skirting around all sorts of dark corners rather yes. than saying this is the only thing that's weird. So, so it's a usefully loose uh, generic that's, term. That's this way of saying, Zara, yeah. is it? I think there's a trend in the academic sphere of trying to pin it down a little bit, yeah. which is interesting. And I don't know if that kind of shows a difference between maybe the reader's perspective and the academic pers perspective. But from somebody who comes from it from both, I would say to me the weird is more of a feeling. Mm -hmm. it's, it's something tangi tangible, it's visceral, it, it's something that you feel in your body, yes. I think, with the yeah. weird. And I think that's particularly interesting and important to the Uncanny Gastronomic for me. Anyway. I like that idea that it's somehow it's somehow it's it's that we perhaps read these stories with our bodies rather than yeah. with our minds. Is that something that can you resonate with that, Tanya? Yeah, I was going to say there's a really great German word, and I don't speak German, and I'm probably going to completely murder it, but it's something like unheimlich. <gasps> yes. Uh, which we once one of my fellow curators is um, from the exhibition is the lead curator of Germanic collections here and we wanted to use it on a label and she was all for this uh, but we weren't allowed to because we have to have our label our labels have to be very easy to understand and it's quite hard to translate on Heimlich <laughs> but it's this kind of like sense of the the unhomely the unhomely, the unhomely yeah, isn't so it it the kind of feeling that things are a bit wrong. And I think that's so interesting because so many of these weird stories are very domestic in setting. Yeah. Not all of them, but a lot of them. Can you give us an example of one that would, uh, would, would answer those criteria? Something that uh, where we are kind of at home, but not at home. And Heimlich's yeah. good. Well, so the collections that I've mostly edited have been the Christmas anthologies. Um, and so they are all so focused on being kind of cosy and comfortable at home but then something strange is going on yes. it's not quite right and um i can think of one there's a good one in your christmas collection about that begins with a, a man looking at a christmas card with two tobogganing boys on it the toboggan the, the jaunty christmas toboggan that's something <laughs> that's something yeah. that seems it like it ought to be fun and nice doesn't it yeah there's kind of uh, there's like demonic uh, pantomime figures, <laughs> there's weird Father Christmases, terrifying Christmas trees, carol singers that are murderous. <laughs> they're, all, they're all in there. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Zara, you talked about the, the academic interest in this field. Is there a sort of taxonomy that's, that's emerging from that work? I mean, we could, can we distinguish the weird from the gothic, for instance? I mean, to my mind, the gothic is... There's often a rational explanation for what, go, what goes on in a gothic story, isn't it? From, from the Castle of Otranto onwards, you get the kind of the seemingly spooky thing, and then you get the, the sort of rational explanation. I don't know whether that you get that in a weird story. Yeah, I think if we're thinking of the weird in terms of the uncanny, there's, it's all about that familiarity, and it's something that's too close to home, it's too similar. We can look at it and we know what it is, but it's coloured differently. Mm. There, there's a different kind of air to it. And I think that adds to the mystique of the weird mm. because the Gothic, while it's not formulaic and there's so many myriad forms of the Gothic, the weird to me has that kind of edge to, to an extent because it can come in so many different forms. And it, <coughs> it's, like we said, it's a bit more, um, it, it's, Physical in the body, but it's no more tangible. Mm. It's maybe a little bit more elusive. Give us an example from your anthology, because all the things you've described, you know, fit with the, that theme of, of food and uh, yeah, I know, mean, the, the weird that you can get inside you somehow. Mm, so there's a story um, by Shelley Jackson called Like Mother Used to Make. And D that is the dirty dishes one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so um, basically someone goes home after work and someone's cooking in, in their home and makes them feel like that's not their home anymore and kind of usurps their space. And that's almost, to me, almost like a modern update on the possession horror almost. Mm. The possession of the house, the possession of the kitchen, the possession of the body, um, all of this kind of, these things being stripped and taken away from you and you have no control but to take the keys and kind of go back to someone else's dusty old flat. Um, so I think it's, it's a lot about that 
lack of agency, maybe. It's such a good... I mean, she was a genius, wasn't she, Shirley Jackson? But a lot of this story is, is like descriptions of the, of, of the knives and forks and what posi and all the different kinds of knives and forks, because the, there's a pie at the centre. There's pie at the centre of this yeah. story, isn't there? So there is, is that kind of that sort of that sort of obsessive side? Is that kind of part of the vibe of it as well? Do you yeah, think? but I think it's also the playing with the mundanity. So the Christmas cards, the knives and forks. Um, to me, what could be more mundane than food? Um, we, we kind of have it all the time. It's something that orders our days. It's very ritual. We eat in three meals. We eat in three courses. It's very ordered. But yet, how is it then made so theological mm. in terms of, you know, we think of Christ's body, Christ, Christ's blood, um, all of that kind of thing. But then it's so easily made demonic. Food is the mode of monsters, in a, in a sense. Johnny, tell us about how, the, how the, the, the series of books came into being. What was it? How did it develop? Well, uh, with a bit of a, a wish on a pun of star in 2018. Um, <laughs> so we had uh, several collections that we'd been publishing in standalone volumes, and Tanya can talk about some of them maybe because she edited them. Um, and then in 2018, we had five collections that were all originally planned as standalone volumes. And we thought, based on the uh, success of the Crime Classic series that we had, actually maybe it was worth sort of making a bit of a commitment and packaging them up into something that uh, people would enjoy collecting. So the, 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 the loyalty that people have to that crime series, mm -hmm. which is very, is very deep, yeah, yeah, our house is full of them, um, <laughs> was, was something that you thought could also be triggered by, by um, the weird, and it was. Yeah, very luckily. It was. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, it felt like there was a, a rising sort of surge of interest in the books that we were producing uh, in that field. And already having sort of scheduled five at once, it felt like this is a natural mm -hmm. time for us to find a way to sort of capitalise on this and design them with nice spines that would look together, uh, good together on a bookshelf, but also to have something that we could then build upon in the years to come if it was successful. And yeah, we're now on, uh, we're publishing our 43rd one wow. this, this Thursday. And you can good. subscribe to them like you can to cheese. There is, there is now uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. a cheese adjacent uh, subscription the service. Two yeah. kinds of subscription. I think, you know, you need the, for, to amplify the effects of the books, you need the cheese, don't you? It's not bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Tanya, do you think there's anything about the, the moment that we find ourselves in that, that makes uh, readers particularly receptive to this kind of material? Or is it, is yeah. it just a nice coincidence that, you, that uh, the British Library has happened upon this idea? Or is there something in the air that makes us, uh, you know, other, is the veil thin at the moment? Or <laughs> <like that>? Always. <laughs> um, well, I found it really interesting looking at the history of these kind of stories that there keeps being moments for them. So um, I know that one of the theories around why they were so pop, ghost stories were so popular in the early 20th century is because um, the kind of modernity, people were looking for something else that was unexplainable and, and not something that science could kind of explain away. And there was a more interest in spiritualism mm. and that all kind of ties into that. Um, and I think that has kind of only got stronger for us. Mm -hmm. So in in an era where things are so kind of much more solid in lots mm. of ways, people want that feeling of kind of wooliness. Um, and I think with the Christmas stories, one of the reasons why people love reading ghost stories at Christmas is because you're kind of hunkered down, you're in the house, you're mm. cosy. Um, and it's a, there's a real kind of uh, contrast to, you know, what what's in the story. Yeah, yeah. But I wonder whether, you know, I mean, the, 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 there's a great renewal of interest in the occult at the moment, isn't it? That seems to be absolutely everywhere. You know, the you know scans of young people using tarot cards, horoscopes, a, a huge res uh, interest, uh, academic interest in. In, in the occult and sort of in practice as well as in as in theory and I I mean my sense of why that is happening is that it's something to do with people feeling um, powerless it's a way of kind of asserting agency um, in a way and I wonder whether the appeal of these stories isn't you know doesn't kind of follow a, a similar sort of track uh, Zara I 
theorised a little bit in my intro mm. that there could potentially be two reasons why we're interested in these things at the moment, and particularly in terms of narratives about um, strange food. So um, Brendan Fraser's The Whale, A.K. Blakemore's um, recent novel The Glutton. There's a lot at the moment where there's, there's this huge interest in, in food as a weird object. And um, my theorisation of that was the idea of bodily permanence and kind of asserting yourself as a bodily presence in a world that's maybe increasingly online, mm. that's increasingly virtual, mm. but then also um, threat to bodies and things that I don't want to say necessarily say one of the C words and go, go there, but the, the pandemic um, and the kind of, we're thinking about threats in different ways and whether they're more um, tangible and physical or if it's something that's more elusive and we can't see. Yeah. And perhaps reading and explore those, exploring those things might make us feel not necessarily more prepared, mm. but maybe a little bit more well-versed in where mm. these threats might be coming from. We are living in a time of invisible threats, aren't we? And the, the idea of miasma is important in a lot of the, these stories, isn't there? Just yeah. things in the air that yeah. harm us somehow, intangible things. Um, can we find out a bit about where you're quarrying these stories from? <laughs> you're going to places where anthologists have not perhaps you know boldly gone before I think Johnny yeah well that's one of the most exciting parts about working on these is coming together with this list or this theme uh, with a short list of things and then seeing where we might be able to pluck something that from an anthology or from a periodical that only exists or is accessible at the library yeah and yeah. um, so then we'll literally find the volume and access it that way and some of these things probably haven't been opened up to be read since they first came into the collection. So that's, yeah, there's kind of a sense of time travel there in some ways. Though. Yeah, I remember I was really keen to say where things had first appeared in the volumes that I edited because I really want people to get that sense that they were in these incredibly ephemeral mm. publications. Mm. And, um, like what? I mean, what are we talking about? So, I mean, there's the kind of, the, there's the Dickens periodicals that people will know about, so All the Year Round and Household Words, but then... Um, there's lots that don't exist anymore. There's, uh, I'm trying to think of some really obscure. There's one, I think there's one called Black and White Magazine or something. Mm. Um, so yeah, there's things that we just have here and yeah. there's not many other places. Yeah. And it's, it's a really great way of us engaging people with the collections because I don't know how often people order up random Victorian periodicals <laughs> in the reading room, but yeah. maybe it's very often. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, these things wouldn't otherwise get. Mm. known about um, and there's loads of people especially women who are writing for periodicals who you know are not kind of known about at all so uh, writing bi for biographies for all these people some of them you're like I have there's to nothing is there yeah, yeah. Um, I mean probably not the real name yeah. of the person um, is yeah. it one of yours because I'm now thinking of a specific one that I think might be from one of the ones that you've edited where you're like saying well it could be this person who's yeah. I've, I've looked on ancestry.com and <laughs> it could be her <laughs> or it might not yeah. be yeah I mean, and sometimes you don't know if they've written any maybe they've only written that one story but that seems odd so then yeah. it probably is an assumed name yeah. um, we're never going to know who that person was does that kind of detective work appeal to you, Zara? Because your your collection is a you know a mixture of people who are very well known. I mean, Christina Rossetti, yeah, because of her because of all her because of the fruit of Goblin Market, I think. Yeah, I mean, I was interested in having a broad range to show that the uncanny gastronomics, you know, it's not just about gone off spoilt food or you know cannibals, even though there is a cannibal yeah, section yeah. if that's your thing. <laughs> um, but. Um, I wanted to show that it's something that's kind of cross eras, cross culture, cross genre. So there's a couple of pieces of um, translated fiction in it. Um, there's an essay by um, Emma K. Fisher, who I absolutely adore. Um, so I wanted to show. Tell me about them. It's she was a, um, an American food writer, and kind of changed the scope of food writing and mixed um, kind of memoir and food writing all together. And her essay is. It's absolutely horrible. You wouldn't believe that it was. <laughs> you you wouldn't believe that it wasn't fiction. Um, but the way that she wrote about food, um, she kind of she described that people around her, writers, were angry with her that she wrote about food, that that's not a writerly thing to do, um, and that she should be thinking about other things. But she basically argued back that something along the lines of 
food is one of the most human things. It's one of the keenest emotions or keenest things that we can share. So I will write about food because like everybody else, I know hunger. And Johnny, what are, the, what are the plums for you that have been pulled out of <laughs> the most obscure places? Because I, I, I think... Um, why are you laughing at that? Why? <laughs> We've already had pie, Shirley Jackson's pie. Play, yeah, yeah. Um, because I'm thinking that there is a history of, of producing anthologies like this, and I think of the ones that, you know, I read, those ones with those terrifying covers of by the Herbert Van Thal anthologies that had like skulls with eyeballs falling out and really disgustingly gruesome stories <laughs> by Dulcie Gray, lovely Dulcie Gray. Um, but there is a, the anthology itself has quite a solid history, doesn't it? Were you trying to kind of break that, break that up a bit? Well, yeah, definitely. So the, the series is massively inspired by some of the major anthology series that have come before. And there is a, a sort of anxiety there of having to do something a little bit different or come up with a, an identity that makes it stand on its own feet. And some of that uh, comes into making sure that there are stories that veteran anthology readers uh, won't have encountered before. So one of the very first ones we did was actually Mike Ashley's uh, anthology of all lost ghost stories. So these were all stories that we don't think have ever been pub republished since their first publication. So that was just pure plums in terms of the plum <laughs> analogy. Um, I think personally, I've <laughs> to continue the plum. Uh, <laughs> the whole uh, William Hope Hodgson, uh, there's several anthologies and stories that have appeared in, uh, in anthologies, not just in his single author yeah. collection. That was an author that I'd never read before. Well, so let's talk about... I mean, he's interesting. I mean, I'd never heard of him before I was sent this. And this is like... Uh, I thought, blimey, there's a series in this, isn't it? Because he's got a kind of long... He's got a kind of... What, how would you describe... Karnaki, is oh, he called? A cult that? detective, yeah. yeah. Karnaki, the ghost finder. There's a sort of yeah. comma in there that was <laughs> it's like awkward to like fit on the backs of books. But occult Sherlock Holmes. But yeah. Yeah. It's like Sherlock Holmes if, at the end, instead of getting a solution, everyone who was listening to the story just walks off profoundly disturbed. <laughs> yes. But now, as, as, a, as a first time reader of Hodgson and Karnacki, Karnacki has this thing where, he, uh, maybe, the, maybe there are lots of you in the audience who know this work really well, but he's always name dropping cases. You know, like Sherlock Holmes will talk about the case of the politician and the cormorant or the giant rat of Sumatra. <laughs> yeah. Are the, is like the case of the nodding door for instance, that he refers to. Are the, is he plucking all the, are these jokes or are these all other stories. I, I think it's a mixture of yeah. them. Yeah. He's, he has got quite a few of them in this sort of series of them, but then he's also made up several uh, sort of reference texts that Karnak he's always going back to and saying, oh yeah, let me check this thing about yeah. prisms and we're going to find out how to get rid of this hog that's possessing you. Yes, the hog. <laughs> that's, the, that's the climax of the volume, isn't it? The hog. Um, so <laughs> when, you, when, you're, you know, when you're working on a, on a uh, writer, like this, who seems to be referring out to bodies of knowledge. Mm. Um, there are different kinds of, you know, he classifies these occurrences, doesn't he, these, the, uh, these phenomena. Is he inventing these, or are you kind of trying to follow these up and, uh, and see where he's drawing these ideas from, or is that research yet to be done? I think part of it probably does cross over into the Society of Paranormal Research, which mm. I can't remember if he was part of that. Psychical part, Research, but, uh, yes. Yeah. There um, are people, well, there, there are names, uh, I, I think it's in his stories, names like Oliver Lodge dropped in mm. um, to create that kind of verisimilitude, I think. Yeah. But could you, I mean, could you take a Karnaki story and, you know, and investigate a phenomena with it, do you think? <laughs> I think we should be doing that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One way or another, yeah. This building's a bit too new, isn't it, really? <laughs> I mean, it's a lot of old books in the basement. Of so. course, yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And the Karnaki stories are ones in which, uh, I don't know whether they're all like this, but there is that, as there often seems to be in stories like this, that device of the story being told in a certain kind of context, mm -hmm. often a kind of clubbable context. It seems to be these you know, men meeting together, and one of them has a... A story to tell. It makes me think, I suppose, of of, uh, of Heart of Darkness or the Time Machine that have that same kind of quality mm. to them. I mean, is this a? This it seems to be a kind of a trope. This idea. What what effect do you think it has? I think it allows 
for some sort of clever devices where yeah. after the main or sort of nested story is finished, you then get the final flourish, which might be, oh, but actually this other thing happened, or the even like, everyone leaving profoundly disturbed into the night. That's the <laughs> thing I mainly remember about some of those Karnaki ones is that it leaves you with that extra sense of like, oh, wow, this is really like embedded in all of yeah. the characters who have listened to it, like it was embedded in me reading this as well. So it does sort of draw you in in an interesting way sometimes. It lets you kind of string the stories together as well to make them to make a longer whole because ghost and kind of supernatural stories work so well as short stories. But if you want to write a longer thing, you need some kind of framing narrative. So I'm thinking about like um, Dead of Night, which is one of my favourite films. Yes. That has that kind of framing yeah. in order to make it into a whole film. Yeah. You have to have that... Um, Yes, the yeah. Ealing film where everybody te- they're all gathered in the country cottage and everybody tells a, yeah. a strange and story. And kind of mini films within the film. Yeah. And a repeated structure. Yeah. Total accident that, you know. Really? Yeah, in the screen, in when they're doing the test screening, the projection is just loaded on reel one again. And, <laughs> and the director thought, hang on, <laughs> that's the idea. And the other weird thing about that, sorry about this, the other weird thing about that <laughs> is that the, the astrophysicist Fred Hoyle saw that yeah. film, and, and at that moment thought of his now discredited idea of the steady state universe, where everything just sort of <laughs> repeated. It's an amazing thing, wow. Dead of Night. Wow. That's an anthology, isn't it? I wonder also if those devices don't create a sort of distance that makes everything so much more dis- attractively disturbing. It, it, makes, it imposes a kind of, f- of, of distance upon it where... Your access to what's really happening is more compromised, Zara. Yeah, I mean, I recently was reading The Great Goth Hand and I was thinking, what's brilliant Braves. is that... Um, off Macken. Oh, sorry, sorry, um, sorry. And I thought what was great about it is that Pan's hardly on the page. Mm. Yeah. You know, there's hardly any encounters with, with Pan. And I think that adds to the mystique. Mm. Like we said, it allows a longer narrative. Yeah. It allows things to be complicated. It allows us to see the effect of Pam, not just kind of, you know, that, that um, glory, glorious image in, in the immediate. So you can see the aftermath of it. And I think that um, it makes you wish there was more Pan on the page. Mm. And I think that's um, yeah. a really important device to use. But that's the whole M.R. James thing as well, isn't yeah. it? It's the idea of, like, it's way more scary if you don't really properly describe it. Mm. Um, yes. Which is why... It's, I mean, they, obviously there have been the famous TV um, adaptations of M.R. James, but it's never quite the same thing. It's, it's what's not there <laughs> that you're... Frank it's a on. glimpse, isn't it? It's, yeah. the, it's the briefest of, uh, of things. You know, something hairy brushes against you in so the, on a staircase. Yeah. <laughs> they are always hairy. I think they too many limbs. Yeah. <laughs> but I wonder also whether there's... I mean, James had this idea that, that, that ghost stories should always be a certain distance away in time as well. And I think that, that maybe that's an important part of the effect of these stories. I was struck, you know, reading a lot of them together, how many of them said... Well, this, I'm not quite sure when this happened, but it was, it was sometime after the Great War. Or there seems to be, they seem to work better somehow if you are not, you know, if, if you haven't got a very direct relationship with the events that are being described. Yeah. Is it a bit like trying to get the mobile phone out of modern horror films? Yeah. Because if you have that, that ability to, yeah, to look up everything or, yes. or get yourself out of the situation... So you've got a similar thing with sort of message in a bottle type narratives or found manuscripts, um, which the House on the Borderland, the really no published novel we've just uh, republished, is that where it's like. Well, tell us about that. Sorry, who well, says so again? Uh, so it's William Hope Hodgson, mm. The House on the Borderland, and the whole thing is it's like multiple nested narrative because yeah. William Hope Hodgson is saying, I got sent this <laughs> from these guys, and then in the narrative, the two protagonists there have found this manuscript in this sort of giant chasm uh, yeah. of waterfalls. And then you read that narrative and all sorts of crazy stuff. That is more that... hogs, more... Uh... Yes, I was going to say, that's <laughs> the one with the, where the pigs come out of the ground, isn't it? <laughs> it's kind of a thing about swine, yeah. <laughs> now, here's, a, here's, a, here's an interesting... Here's, a, here's something that occurs to me. One of the things that, that these stories keep coming back to is 
is disgust, isn't there? Disgust is an important element in these stories. What does that tell us, Zara? I think um, that's what my entire thesis is trying to look at. So um, <laughs> um, there's um, about 80,000 words I could say on that. Um, <laughs> but I think... Um, well, we've got that. We've, well, I yeah. we need to get our next guest on question. Um, but give, us the, but give us the, give us the um, think, abstract. Um, something that I think is fascinating is that Mikhail Bagtin, a literary critic, um, wrote that... The, he, he wrote a lot on the carnivalesque body, on the disgust of the carnivalesque body, on the lower bodily function, and how that's related to the folk, to the collective, to kind of the general public, which is already quite an interesting um, contention and a thing to draw. Um, but something else he said was that um, the swallowing, gaping mouth is the most ancient and most important image mm. in our kind of cultural imagination. And that's because that shows how we come in contact with the world and how the world comes in contact with us. And by tasting the world, the world, in a way, devours us. So I think, again, it's all about that permeability and how that open, openness and that knowledge of openness does create that feeling of disgust. There's also the idea of the wisdom of disgust, though, isn't there? That the reason why we are disgusted by things is that often nasty things are bad for us, you know, which is why we don't, you know... Eat and we tend not to eat unpleasant things that could make us ill. But I wonder whether uh, what where the stories stories like this place us in relation to that idea. When would when things are disgusting? You know, there are books in this series that are about mm. insects and yeah. you know moths and worms and this kind of thing. Generally, are we right to be horrified by the things that horrify us in these tales? Oh, what a question. I can't read the insect one because I find it too, like, scratchy. I think that's, that, that's, that's an interesting one. I mean, Jeanette, who uh, co-edited it, is here today. But um, part of the point of that one was to get across that there was more to it than just beetle is going to get you. Because some, <laughs> some of your insects are, per, are sort of good insects, aren't they? Yes, yeah. 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 Benevolent. Moths. Yeah, there is a benevolent <laughs> moth. <I think. laughs> yeah. All moths are benevolent, I think, can't they? <laughs> and with that, I think, <laughs> I think we, I might ask you to flutter away back into the audience, and we can, we can, we'll ask, we'll get you back for some questions at the end. But the, these seats are going to have a, a couple more occupants. So thank you very much for the moment, Johnny, Tanya, and Dara. So, where are you? There they are. Now, will you welcome to the stage, please, Matthew Holness and Julia Armfield. Hello. Come and sit down. Come and sit by me. Okay, I'll sit, I'll sit going, I'm not, you know, no. It looks a bit like we're doing a seance now and a lot of people haven't turned up. Well, we'll have... <laughs> we know that there are people there. The two people here, Julia Armfield, winner of the White Review Short Story Prize, 2018, author of the, uh, the collection Salt Slow, highly acclaimed, and author of the, the novel Our Wives Under the Sea, which is up for this year's uh, Polari Prize. And Matthew Holness here, writer, actor, comedian, Perrier um, Award uh, winner. Um, uh, his alter ego is sort of hovering over him, I think, Garth Marenghi, we all know him. We've known him for decades. Decades. He's older than all of us, isn't he, really? Goes back a long way. But you're having a rather as kind of, you know, monstrous dead things always return. Yes. You're having a huge new burst of life, I think, at the moment. Yeah, I'm slowly turning into him, so... <laughs> yeah. Matthew um, is sort of on tour at the moment, but this isn't part of it. No. Is it? No, and I, I'm not him. No. So yeah. I'll be nice. I'll, I'll be nice to you. It'll be nice. And also, if you try and ask a question to Garth Marenghi, something bad will happen to you. <laughs> let, let us just uh, say that. I want to know about how the pair of you got into this uh, sort of fiction. I mentioned the Herbert Van Thal anthologies, which we passed around at school in various states of terror. Mm. But uh, you're too young to for those, aren't you? Yeah, I don't yeah. know what you're talking about. <laughs> 
<laughs> so what, who, was your, who was your Herbert Van Thal? Oh, that's such a good question. I mean, the problem is whenever people start asking me questions like this, I have to firstly stipulate that I absolutely can read. But at the other point, it's, I, will, I will then immediately start referencing movies. And so I'm going to try and not oh. do that. But I think a lot of what happened to me came from accidentally seeing things far too young on television because you get, you get a, a creepy little taste for it that way. But I think that... Quite early on, I got. I, I, I'm very into William Hope, William Hope Hodgson mm. as well, and things like um, Arthur Macon, and also dear old Uncle Steve, Stephen King, was is very, very important to me. And I think quite early on, I was just. I'm really fascinated as well by when you find horror in peculiar situations and places where you're not expecting them. And the fact that you often find it in comedy as well. Mm -hmm. I was speaking to my friend literally today um, who she was talking about, there's a, I can't remember which one it is, but one of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxies where there's this sudden, there's this scene where they're all in stasis on a plane um, and their hair has grown horrendous and their nails have grown horrendous because they've been there for so long. And then every so often they'll get woken up and given like a lemon serviette by, by the staff. And they're all screaming and clawing at themselves and then they go back into stasis again and I think the creepiness of that yeah. and being finding it in unexpected places I think was worked on me from quite a young age and so I wanted to shove that into what I was doing. So they weren't necessarily your inspirations weren't necessarily literary then they were images from film and from and vibes in general yeah. often gets me I vibes think. just just where like, do you experience those vibes do you oh live? everywhere like out in the um the Somerset House uh, horror exhibition quite recently drove home to me. There was this there was this whole screen they had of just like horrible things which you wouldn't actually have expected to be horror. And there were things like the music video for Firestarter. It was absolutely horrendous. <laughs> and when you're quite young and you're watching that on a music channel, you're just like, this is this isn't happening to me. And things like that. And I think it's it's often that for me, just being being taken by surprise by being absolutely disgusted by something and then wanting to do that to someone else. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Matthew? I'm imagining that your, your answer might be something to do with ye yellowing paperbacks of the sort that we find in bed and breakfast. Yes, <laughs> yes. I mean, I grew up in and around all of, all of that and was very fortunate to grow up at the time when Stephen King and James Herbert were coming of age and, you know, becoming the, the writers that, they, that they're celebrated for now. So, and, and also, I think when I was growing up, there was no real sense of children shouldn't read this particular thing. So, I mean, it, it's the classic thing of going into the video store and seeing all the horror stuff at the back and slowly creeping your way around and going, what the hell is that? That is absolutely disgusting. Um, so, yes, I'm kind of fortunate to have grown up in the 80s where horror was everywhere. Yes. But it was also marketed to children. You know, weird stuff. You know, there were horror crisps, there were horror everything. Oh, wow, weren't yeah. there? Yeah, so yes. it's kind of, it was, it, was, it was kind of like a Star Wars thing almost. It was yeah. like, there was just Dracula and Frankenstein. Ever, and the Hammer films, they were shown, not to children, but I used to tape them every night. <laughs> so, yeah. You, yeah. you weren't one of these... I mean, you know, I don't know who, who would do this sort of thing. You weren't one of these, these boys who stayed up late to, to watch Lust for a Vampire on a black and white portable. Of course I was, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, in fact, the first one I saw was, was Dracula AD 1970. Oh, really? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Oh Which I saw about age seven. <laughs> <laughs> and then you went, I bet they're all like this. It's all just I hope they're all like this, yes. Um, yeah. And what about, what about literary sources, though? What about, did you have a sense, either of you, of like the hierarchy of stories like this? That there was Angela Carter and there was Guy N. Smith's Crabs? <laughs> Depends. I mean, I remember taking A-level English and being told off that I was head deep in, in Stephen King's It at the time. Mm -hmm. And, and they were, that was really frowned upon. Yeah. And I had to stop reading it, which I didn't do, obviously. But that was, it was, it was kind of frowned on at school. It really wasn't the kind of thing that, you know, you were expected to, to, to read at a, for A-level English or anything like that. Oddly, now it would be absolutely fine. <laughs> you know, they'd go, great. Yes, of course, this is a classic, you know, coming of age, genre, novel. Um, it, it's odd. That's, it, it's, a, it's a real change in how, how these... Uh, how these sorts of stories are now perceived. They're now perceived, I think, as, as worthy of critical attention. Um, and I'm not sure that's really happened in, until the last, you know, the, the last decade or so, really. So do you think you're a beneficiary of that, uh, Julia? Because your, 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 you know, your work from the start was taken very seriously, wasn't I, it? And I, it was. I think, though, 
though, that there is, I think it would be very incorrect to act as though genre gets a pass now, because I think, I get, to, I get very fortunately to be taken seriously because I'm hanging around on a borderline in terms of being literary fiction, being genre, being this or that. And I think that genre snobbery gets us nowhere at all because in whatever case, everybody is pulling on genre, whatever they actually happen to be writing, whether you're, you know, you're doing a bit of crime, you're doing a bit of horror, you're doing whatever. But I think in a broader sense, what we were saying, and we were saying this before, I think it's so true that if anything persists beyond a certain point, it will sort of acquire the status of art in a way, in the way that anything that was maybe tacky about 30, 40 to 50 years ago will suddenly now be culture. Mm. But I don't think that we're in a place where like lots of horror or lots of genre is being nominated for the Booker Prize. Mm. I don't think that we're in a place where that's just what happens now. And it's, I don't know, it's a shame and I think it's constantly missing a trick because this is actually the thing that I think inspires most people. What are your thoughts on that, Matthew? Um, well, I, 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 largely, I, I kind of agree. Really, it's in that. I mean, there were a lot of. I mean, interesting, a lot of the stories, or certainly some of the authors, William Hope Hodgson, for example. Now, he was featured quite a lot in seventies anthology paperbacks, and there was there was a, a good tradition of of horror anthology paperbacks in the 60s and 70s. And, there, and people, I think Mike Ashley was mentioned, and there were lots of very good, um, Peter Haining, mm -hmm. lots of very, very good anthologists who did find these very obscure um, tales and would put out these wonderful little themed, uh, in fact, I, I picked up a handful in a National Trust bookshop the other day, <laughs> yes, yesterday, in fact. But there was one, that, a set of four Gothic Victorian horror anthologies. And this was sort of mid-1970s with beautifully illustrated covers of, uh, of kind of Victorian characters, um, you know, sort of Jekyll and Hyde type figures, beautifully depicted. So I kind of think this stuff's always been there, and there have been people that have, have known it's good and known actually it's good writing. But I think, I suppose it's a little bit like, the, the, I guess there were also the pulp magazines as well. Weird Tales, for example, if we're talking specifically about weird. What's interesting about Weird Tales is that if you pick up an old... Uh, magazine of uh, an old copy of Weird Tales, there are so many different types of stories in there, all of which became, you know, their own separate genres over a while. There was, you know, the kind of invented sword and sorcery as a genre. Um, and so I think it's, you know, it's, it's th th they have then slowly grown to become acceptable kind of literary um, genres and styles and um, so yes, it's kind of, I don't know how long it'll take for, it's been there for so long and, and it's been recognised by people who love this stuff for so long, but yet, as you say, it's, it's still not kind of properly accepted in, in kind of literary terms, you know. Maybe not properly accepted, but I wonder whether, Julia, you know, you can't feel any nostalgia for the world that Matthew uh, is describing. I mean, your, your books are beautifully designed, aren't they, aren't they? Um, and perhaps you know your 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 predecessors would have been published yeah. with rather different imagery on the covers. You no, know, I think like you're so right. Women, you know, women in corsets running away from castles, should that sort of it. thing. Absolutely, yes. yeah. Everything should have been that. Somebody in just like a leather bikini crying. <laughs> I think that's that's really that's what I want for the front. No, I completely agree. And I think as well that and this always happens. I think to subcultures is that there is always a certain nostalgia from when it was your little secret, and everything is so much. Everything is being discovered all the time and everything is different and people are accepting the facts that like freaks drive the culture so much more than they used to so I think that I know what you mean I think there's definitely a there's a nice idea of I don't like people like you don't like people finding your thing that mm. was that was what it mm. was but yeah Matthew what does the perspective of being somebody who is both a, a, a practitioner and a parodist mm. to your sense of the of this field I mean I think that a parodist a parodist certainly has to uh, all parodists have to know mm. how to do this properly, and parody is perhaps isn't just. To, I mean, to my mind, just another form of doing it properly. Yes, I mean, I, I, in fact, there's been quite a few authors that special that subsequently are known for their weird writing or their or their horror writing, whatever. People, I think, was it Jerome K. Jerome, who's written comedy novels, but also wrote creepy ghost stories, um, and I think there's a tradition of of, you know, parodying something that you know quite well and also write, you know, um, because you're interested in what it is you're parodying. So I think if, if I was going to try, try and sort of wonder where the crossover is, I think 
for me, it's a little bit about doing the same thing. If you're parodying something, well, one, you love it. So, you know, that's, that's in fact, I, I think I started doing, for example, the Garth Rengi character because I really wanted to write horror fiction, but didn't think I'd ever be good enough or had, had never published anything. Yeah. So I thought, well, I know I can do a bit of comedy, so why don't I just sort of go in and, and parody it? And then I'm sort of writing horror. Right. Um, and then slowly, you know, started writing it for real, and then you've got the, the two things happening. But I guess it's... In certain ways, you know, telling, some, telling a joke relies on very specific sense of timing and a sense of surprising the audience. You need to know what it is you're doing. You need to kind of hoodwink the audience. And I think anyone who writes a very good ghost story or is doing exactly the same thing. They are time, timing moments, timing effects for maximum impact. And often that is surprising. And this is what's interesting about weird fiction in that you are these writers are finding things that are unpredictable moments, unpredictable images, vis visuals that, are, that surprise the reader and create that sense of uncanny and the sense of creepiness or whatever. But it's often about, you know, playing with what you know and the effects that you want, but being able to kind of throw in um, something that no one's expecting from left field and surprise. And I think that, so I think both doing comedy and that, they do similar things, I think. It's a similar approach. I think. It's so true. There's like a scare and a joke is often the same thing or the mm. same. And it's there's I don't know like people like I don't know like Benson or something who's very good at writing ghost stories and very good at yes. writing comedy. Yeah. I mm. think is is so interesting yeah. that skill yeah, yeah. is in both ways. And how does that work in your stories? Because I can see perhaps those structures at, at work in in your work too. That you begin with something very specific mm. and and in a way develop it in you know too extreme or too an, you know we get to an unusual place from mm. something sometimes quite mundane. Oh, mundanity is the mm. thing I'm really interesting because I'm not funny in the slightest and so I think like bad skin or yeah, not yeah, being yeah. able to sleep exactly yes. and I think that I'm because I think that there is so much uncanny in mundanity because there's always I don't know there's the thing that I've been interested in in my writing the whole way through is when everything is absolutely normal and there's just something a little bit off going on over here and I think that's often what I build from when I'm, I'm putting something together because usually when I'm writing I will come from kind of one particular image in my head and it will usually be that and I'll kind of, I'll blow it out from there. And I think that the thing I'm so interested in is the way that people, when something horrific or something peculiar is going on, most of the time people don't actually react by screaming and shouting and tearing their hair out. I don't think people often actually have that sort of Lovecraft and then the thing and, uh, and it just goes on like that. I think people make an accommodation and I don't always think that's a good thing. I think that can speak to people being, being sort of adaptable, but I think it can also speak to apathy. And I'm interested in that tension. Again, not to, not to drop the C word, but I think the past few years have very much sort of proven that actually when something weird goes on, people do just, mundanity and dailiness asserts itself. Mm. And there is a horror in that as well, I think, which is something which I'm often playing with when I'm writing. So we're quite good at accommodating strangeness in mm. daily life, maybe a bit too good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think so. So what, so uh, let's think about, because I asked our previous uh, panelists about, about whether we were living through times that were particularly attuned to this mm. uh, kind of thing. If we are, then you're both the beneficiaries of that in some <laughs> way, <laughs> aren't you? You know, what do you, what do you think, what do you, what's your sense of what your readers are getting from the experience of? I don't know, I mean, I've always found, uh, I found horror fiction, oddly enough, to be escapism mm. a lot over the years. I've, I've found particularly the, the stranger stuff, a total escape from reality. And I think that might be a, a, a big reason why it, there's a resurgence, because I think it is, um, it's, it's a total escape from all the horrific things that we just don't seem to be able to find any way of compartmentalizing or, or, pro, or processing. Um, I think that's, you know, one of many things. I, I also think that, um, what was I also thinking? I can't remember. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I think... <laughs> <laughs> what do you think, Julia? Um, no, I think, I think you're completely right, firstly. I think that there is, uh, there is escapism in horror. I think there's also community in mm. horror because it's, I think it's one of the genres where 
if you like it and somebody else likes it, that's all you can talk about. And there is something about that in very disjointed times, which I think is actually quite mm. meaningful to people. Um, and beyond that as well, even with really horrendous things sometimes, there is oddly, and I may be just showing my hand as an absolute pervert at this point, but I think that there <laughs> is there is coziness to horror because it does... It does kind of make you think of that strange Christmas vibe, even when you're not reading a Christmas ghost story. It makes you think of the fact that actually maybe I am safe despite the fact that this is going on. And I don't know. I think that there's something as well about the familiarity of certain ghost stories, certain horror movies for me. As soon as you've got over the scares the first time or the jump scares or the unexpected, that movie very quickly becomes your friend. And so I have it when I'll just like, I'll rewatch like The Exorcist as a comfort movie or something mm. and be like, I think there's something a bit wrong with me, but I do also think that there is, I don't know, I think it makes sense. But yeah. I, I mean, the horror genre is so kind of all encompassing. Mm. There are so many different types. There's very, as you say, communal horror experiences. We all have a good horror film that we can share with friends. I mean, my personal preference is for the kind of miserable horror that you can only absorb on your own and feel very depressed like and what? lonely reading. Rocking. You know what I mean? There's that, that's, there's that kind of story. Um, someone, for example, like Sheridan Le Fanu um, doesn't write M.R. James-type cosy ghost stories. Yeah. He writes deeply prob worrying, depressing... What, you know, they're all psycho deep yes. psychological ghost stories, and really, they are not to be experienced in company. They are very much you and him getting inside your head. You know, is that because there is there is in Lefanu there's less of a maybe Lefanu is a weird author rather than an author of ghost stories because of the, that uh, the absence of that reassurance. You know, in Lefanu we might drink green tea and we might yeah. see an evil monkey on the bus. But in M.R. James, we're, we're a sloppy ap academic who gets punished for our, our bad Latin translation <laughs> by, you know, something unspeakable brushing up against uh, us in our, um, well, it's all our, I our think, bread and breakfast. I mean, Le Fanu has a few of those things. I mean, a lot of his stories do have all the things you've been discussing tonight, like the, the, the framing narratives. But his framing narratives are not so much suspended... They, they do suspend your disbelief. They, they do serve that function of br bringing you slowly into the supernatural tale it's about to... But also, often they are, I think, they kind of undermine the story. The, because if you read them psychologically from who is narrating... Martin Heselius is the character in, in, uh, in A Glass Darkly. And, and he is... He's actually, if you read... If you kind of read into what he's doing, particularly with Green Tea, the story, I think there's a moment in the story where he could actually have helped the guy and prevented him dying. Right. He doesn't. Yeah. Um, and, he do and he seems to take no... Um, you know, he, he, he's quite happy with the fact the guy's died, but he didn't, doesn't think for one minute, actually, I, I decided to just sit around. I left him alone in the house with, the, with this monkey, and now he's dead. <laughs> um, so I, th I think there's something different going on with him. He does use the same thing, th those same kind of devices, but there's, there's, a, there's a psychological aspect or element to them which are a bit more troubling, I think. Mm. Do you think it's also there's a difference in the kind of the moral or the theological world that these stories occupy? I mean, Lefanu was like a Swedenborgian, yes, wasn't he? Yeah, and I, yeah. I never, however hard I try, I never really understand what being a Swedenborgian is. Well, the only really. thing I could... But, was it it's almost like the ghosts can kind of come back as real things and there's kind of two universes that converge and the world of the dead is kind of living at the same time alongside our world and that occasionally you will kind of, you know, one will step over into the other. So it is this weird kind of, it's not, it's not a religious afterlife particularly, it's, it's something a bit weird. It's actually a bit more Lovecraftian, I think, in yes. the sense that there's this malicious, malign god yeah. that thinks, you know, it's a joke. Human, you know, mankind is a joke and we're just going to muck around with you. You know, he refers to things like the machinery of the universe, yes. I think, in that story. So I think... Yeah, there is. That's very w of the weird, I yeah. think. Yeah. More that, than, yeah. That is really weird. But so in an M.R. James story, I sort of know where I am in the yeah, universe. Yeah. If I make a stupid mistake, I will be punished for it. Yeah, mm. and I think there's a very, there's a very tangible morality in them. In most of the time, it's sort of like. Um, the Stephen King book, uh, Dance Macabre, which is about sort of the tropes of horror, and it's usually about actually horror is quite comforting because it is about how the world will right itself or it will try to right itself, like this sort of like heaving beast at the end of something. And so even if everything goes wrong, you as the reader still know what is right and wrong. And I think that the weird is when you're not so mm, aware yes. of that, you know? 
the, the, the moral machinery of the mm. weird world seems much more uh, peculiar and yeah. hard and, and perhaps dysfunctional. Yes, they're, they're not, exactly, it's, they're not morality stories yeah. at, at all, really. They, they are very much working on a, a kind of subconscious level yes. that is very much about, you know, what makes an individual tick. And, you know, we're all different, different things creep us out. And often it's those things that, you know, you wouldn't think would automatically creep someone out can, can sometimes be the most, for, for, you know, we're talking about the food and things like that, things like that that suddenly there is something there that just will make you uneasy and you don't really know why. <laughs> Of nihilistic about it sometimes as well. It reminds me a bit of the um, uh, the Roger Corman Poe series or mm, something, mm. which is quite sickly and it doesn't really inhabit a moral universe again. Perhaps because quite often it's quite medieval and quite unrecognisable in its way. And I think it's there's something in that as well. So, is if the weird is an escapist genre, is it those structures that it allows us to escape from? You know, I know if I read a uh, you know, I've described the moral world of M.R. James, but like, you know, if I read a Dennis Wheatley novel, <laughs> I'll know that dabbling is the most terrible thing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if you know how to do it properly, that's fine, but <laughs> dabbling. <laughs> and, you know, that brings you into contact with with evil, yeah. which is always much worse than evil, isn't it? Evil. I mean, those are fun, because they are reassuring. Yeah. As you say, it's reassuring to know that good will triumph over evil, yeah. and yeah. and it's quite nice, and they're very enjoyable, but whether or not they actually frighten you that much, well, I don't know. I mean, obviously, The Exorcist plays very heavily on that, yeah. and yeah. maybe that's innate in us, we, the, the, you know. But yes, weird, I think, operates differently from that. Yeah. I mean, what is it? Can we, can we kind of, as, as we, as we, we will be, I'll be reconvening everybody in just a moment, but <laughs> can we have a go at, at sort of, 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 of um, getting to the essence of that, of what, of what the weird is? Is it, an, is it where logic no. breaks <laughs> down? Or, I'm thinking that, you know, like um, a writer like Robert Aikman, mm. who, who described his stories as strange, but I think we can have him for the weird, yeah. can't we? Where one thing doesn't necessarily lead to another. We're in a universe where cause and effect... Yeah don't quite seem to function. He can go somewhere, he'll, you know, the a protagonist will drive to a hotel and it'll be very hot and everybody will be eating Yorkshire mashed potato and he'll notice that some of these people, one of these people has their ankle chained to a rail mm. under mm. the table. We never quite know why, we're never quite told why that is happening, but is the idea of the unresolved important. And the dream to... logic as well, mm. I think, from something like that, because then you, you so often, yeah, you can find yourself into a Freudian space with that kind of writing very, very quickly, I think. I interrupted you, sorry. No, 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 you didn't. No, um, no I, 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 yes, I, th I think he, he's a perfect example because I've read Aikman's stories and I've been absolutely really creeped out and frightened and I have no idea why. Mm. It's like it's getting to what you think it might be about, but then something else is thrown in the mix and, you know, and it ends like any good ghost story does with, you know, it being an enigma. You can't, yeah. you can't, pick, you can't nail down what it is. And that's, you know, the, for me, the best ghost stories work like that. You know, if once, when the ghost is explained, it's what a little bit get, you know, I, I, I don't really like the ghost stories that uh, a lot of Victorian ghost stories where it, it's because it's a, you know, it's a ghost that's taking vengeance. It's uh, someone was murdered and it's coming back. I like those ones where, you know, the modern 20th century ghost story. And Le Fanu was very much like that. His ghost stories aren't explained really. They, you know, they, there's lots in there. You don't really know why it's happening or what, what it is. But yes, I think probably the weird is that 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 quality of, of things not being resolved, yeah. perhaps, and not being able to be, you know, explained away. Yeah. Um, there's no tidy, tidiness or tidy endings. W yeah. With Aitman, I, I sort of sense that the stories of things, that you, as you go on, you know less and less and less, so yeah. that sometimes his protagonist can come out of a situation like, well, I've forgotten the name of it now, but there's one where the guy goes into... into um, uh, He's shown kind of somebody's underwear drawer and invited to kind of uh, <laughs> touch all. It's slightly Mrs. Danvers's, that Danvers-ish, and then something like a monkey runs down from a chandelier, and then he's out onto the street, and it ends with him saying, "I think not even who am I, but what am I?" Mm. As if the experience of being in the story has completely mm. um, taken him to pieces. Mm. 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 Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And there we are, and, th and we're out on the street now thinking, who are we? <laughs> what are we? Well, we may have forgotten that temporarily, but let's ask our, our three uh, previous panellists back onto the stage. So you know, I think some applause to cover Johnny, Candy and Zara getting back into those, uh, back into those seats.
seats. We should check in with how you found the last uh, half hour or so, I think. Anything you'd like to respond to from what you've uh, heard there from, uh, from Julia and, uh, and Matthew? No pressure. Well, that, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> about weirdness. Are we nearer to, are we, are we getting nearer to discovering what, what weirdness so. is? It's sort of the ragged edges. It's all coming together but not coming together at the same time. Yeah. Which is fitting. Yeah. yeah. Yes. As we find ourselves at the ragged edge of this discussion. <laughs> Yes, yeah. <laughs> Maybe it's time to open it out to you. I think we've got questions um, online, um, which uh, might be appearing on an iPad. We br can we bring the lights up, perhaps? I don't know whether that's allowed. Yeah. Wow, look yeah. at that. God, they were here. Yeah. yeah. Which one oh, you are weird, aren't you? <laughs> I think it's those two. Yes, yeah. that one's mine. Yes. Um, and we've got um, a mic in the audience, too. So if you have a, yeah, if you have a, a thought or a question. There's one on the front row. Oh, I'm sorry to make you do this. <laughs> The next one won't be on the back row. The next one will be like a couple of rows behind. So stick your hand up and the microphone will come to you. I'm just filling here. Can you tell? Oh, good. <laughs> yes. Very good. There we go. Yes. Hi. So question for Johnny and Tanya, I guess. I was wondering how you line up what you're going to be doing in the Tales of the Weird series. So like next year, you've got a weird romance one coming and the intuitive thing might have been for that to come out before rather than after the one on spooky tattoos. <laughs> <laughs> You're asking about what order they should Well, no, out. just how, how do you decide yeah. kind of oh, what, what, what theme shall we do next? <laughs> Where are we going to go? Uh, so I suppose some of it comes back to how I was saying the series developed in the first place, where it was quite organic to begin with. Um, we didn't necessarily expect it to go to 43 volumes right off the bat. So as you say, there are some fairly sort of outlier themes and volumes that are perhaps less obvious to have done sooner. Um, I think it was the Evil Roots volume we did of the killer plants that was our kind of gateway into, right, maybe we can actually start to explore stranger corners. And I think Uncanny Gastronomic was another one of those where it's, it's these themes that you think, could this form its own themed collection? And then when you actually talk to the expert editors, it's like, oh, yeah, there's something really special here. Um, in terms of the the ones going forward, I have a, a massive <laughs> pile of proposals and uh, ideas that we're always kind of going back to and we'll assess the sort of next two seasons at a time um, to make sure we've got a good balance between different anthologies. So there might be some that we've actually had for quite a while in development but would fit more naturally with other ones because we know that some people are collecting pretty much the whole series yeah. as it goes yeah. through. So there's a sort of consideration there. People come to you now, though, right? You don't have to go out and say, we collect. Yeah, that started happening a few years ago, yeah, where people yeah. would come to me and I would get stressed about the amount of <laughs> yeah. weird proposals coming into the inbox. But it's obviously it's amazing and it's very, yeah. I'd love to be in on the meetings where you kind of decide whether something is weird enough to go, <laughs> weird enough to go in. Have you it's got, great. like, a, have you got criteria? Is there a... Is there a process for this? I mean, part of it is the reaction within the team. When I was yeah. talking about the sort of cannibalist uh, aspect of this one, one of my colleagues was very upset, I think. <laughs> 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 yeah. Not upset, but yeah, uh, disgusted, perhaps. Disgusted. Um, and in, then when you get the couple... email to be told that you're weird enough, it's a great... It... Is it? Yeah, <laughs> that's that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, but weird enough, but also commercial enough. We are trying to make money that comes back to the library, so it yeah. can't be too off-kilter. Too weird. Too weird. <laughs> As you sift okay. through all this material, it strikes me that you must, I mean, not all of it is wonderful, is it? Oh there must no, be, can you tell me about the, <laughs> some of the really terrible bits of writing, ter terrible, horrible, diabolical writing that well, you've encountered? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> Johnny's seen my spreadsheets that I do that have, I have like a score for, um, is it Christmassy enough? Is it scary enough? And is it good <laughs> writing? And, um, yeah, there's some where you're like, yeah, this was great, except for the creepy uncle, which <laughs> I think is not very PC, and so we won't... <laughs> there's, a lot, there's quite a lot of cuts for um, things that are not acceptable anymore. Oh, really? Yeah. That's... Yeah, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the, ones, the ones that I've done, I've had to make some... I noticed there's a story... I've forgotten who it's called, uh, who it's by now, but there's one about a mountaineer, haunted mountaineer. Yeah. What's that one? Now, yeah, you describe yeah. the... The protagonist is that as unreconstructed. 
<laughs> and it's really true. But blimey, it's an incredible piece of writing where he talks about his the woman who, who he's going to marry yeah. in that story. She's, Johnny found that one. That's, amaz that's an amazing story. <laughs> I feel like I want to hear you read some of that out, actually. But the, the conceit of it is that this is a very small mountaineer who gets engaged to this very tall, muscular yes. woman. Yeah. And the, it becomes very important that this later when she fall, when she This is giving it away, isn't it? Spoiler. When something happens up a mountain. <laughs> 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 but he's incredible. The, the writing about her is incredibly obnoxious, but it's quite yeah. brilliant, I think. That's one of those hard things to figure out, though. Is have they written a fantastically obnoxious character, or is the author a terrible person? Do we care? Yeah. <laughs> Why should we care? Well, we don't necessarily. It, yeah. I suppose it depends yeah, how it fits within the collection, whether it feels like people will actually enjoy it or not. I think that's yeah. quite a big consideration. Um, do you think that... I'm hogging this a bit, aren't I? Do you think that, uh, that writing can accrue weirdness as time goes on? Because a lot of these stories that are being quarried out of the archives might read more oddly to us than they did to their original uh, readership, you know, as values and attitudes shift across time. Mm -hmm. Well, you're, you're, I mean, in some ways, you're, you're reading a ghost's voice a lot of the time, aren't you? Because you're now reading from somebody who is, is very often not alive anymore or is talking about an entire sort of situation and things which is gone. So I think that can be quite strange, depending on the story. And what do you think? Well, I'm trying to remember the name of this really very strange short novel, and it's about anarchists, and it's very famous. Sort of, Thursday? Yes, yeah. <laughs> Man Thursday, Thursday, which is a very weird read. And I don't know if it was always weird, but it's, that felt like weird fiction reading it. Mm. And yet it's never marketed as that, is it? It's so if you're interested in The Man Who's Thursday, the, uh, the original manuscript is on display in the fantasy. Hey! Ah. <laughs> which when we, when we ordered it up, turned out it's like almost 100% G.K. Chesterton's drawings. It's like a storyboard of oh, the wow. novel. Brilliant. Yeah. It's really amazing. So <laughs> well, let's have another question. Stick your hand up and the mic will come to you. Yes, right in the middle there. Where is the... Where, oh, that's not so bad. <coughs> Hi. Um, I was wondering if you think there's something about the weird or the uncanny that particularly lends itself to anthologies as a style of uh, storytelling, where maybe it's more unsettling because you've got a story from a writer and then instantly the next story is something completely different in a completely different style. Um, so I was just wondering if you think that anthologies naturally suit stories like these better? Great question. I guess, I, sorry. I, no, no, please. <laughs> um, I was going to say that I think one of the really fun things about genre writing is that it gives you uh, kind of recognisable blocks that you're building something out of, but that you can put them together in like almost any way and they'll all be different. Um, they're all kind of recognisably weird, but as we were saying, like you can have macabre weird or ghostly weird or um, kind of uncomfortable, disgusting weird, and we kind of recognise them all as the same thing. But they, there's so much diversity within that, and I think it's great that there's kind of some comedy stories in some of mm. these volumes, and it's a genre that you can send up, and it it doesn't. It, it doesn't stop the kind of the scary ones being scary. Do you know what I mean? It doesn't spoil them because we can also laugh at them. There's so many tones. It, Zara, is it like constructing a menu? Yeah, I mean, my book's laid out as a kind of um, with different courses. So there's um, the dessert is those for the taste of human flesh, if that um, makes you fancy. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think it's interesting to think about um, what we all find weird is different. So I've spoken to people who have. Um, who've read the book and each store each person has a favorite story each person has one that i find that the weirdest i feel this i feel that this story is the most unsettling mm -hmm. and i think that's what's so great about these anthologies is that everyone is going to bring their own kind of i guess neuroses mm. to these readings <laughs> and then we're naturally going to pick different things out and specific images will stick with specific people in that anthology style lets that happen. What about a collection of, when you're putting together a collection of short stories, <laughs> Julia, I mean, what, is that like anthologising your own work? Could, the, could Salt's, Salt's Low stories have gone in any order? I think probably I think. Oh, that's such an interesting question. I think to some degree, yes. I think it always had to, 
with Salt Slow specifically, I think whilst I was writing a lot of different stories, I was very much in my head, I was inhabiting one world where I think a lot of this stuff could happen. And so this isn't really a spoiler because it's a short story collection, so who cares? But like the <laughs> first story compared to the last story, the last story very much feels like the end of that world. And so I think it definitely had to go there. And it's not, I don't think it's weird in the same way that you were um, saying because it's not, it's not tonally disjointed because of course it's all coming from the same is coming from the same writer, but I think that there is, there's definitely a level, like you say, of different sort of subgenres within within the larger weird genre, and you can you can kind of put people off and make things a little bit strange by coming back and forwards. And like one story is about turning into a bug, and then one story is just about like hanging out with a band, and you can push extremity in different ways that way, which I think is a real like treat with a short story collection sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yes, hand up there. Oh, sorry. There are two mics in this audience, aren't there? <coughs> Can we set one up on the other side as well so nobody has to... Yes, there's one there. So let's have you first and then we'll come to, we'll come to you up, up there. Did you put your hand up then? No, that was just you waving your arms. Okay, well, <laughs> <laughs> well let's, let's go with you then. Hi, uh, um, I have a question from online from um, Chris. And Chris is asking about... Um, He's raising a point about the uncanny gastronomic, that there seems to be more stories from more recent authors than there are in the other anthologies and tales of the weird. Is that something that you're going to look into doing more, I guess, more modern authors in future anthologies? Or is it going to stay your, your quite old, <laughs> old stories <laughs> from a long right. time ago? <laughs> um, well, I'll answer a part and then maybe pass on to you because the way that we've been doing these is mainly sort of editor-led. Um, so we'll try to get a collection of stories together that most encapsulates their theme. Um, there, is, there are cost implications of having lots of uh, in-copyright materials, but that's sort of by the by. If we can try to create something um, yeah, that best fits the vision, and I think the Uncanny Gastronomic was something that needed some of these more modern stories to actually explore properly. Yeah, I mean, um, for me, I, my research is in the uncanny gastronomic, something I'm theorising in terms of contemporary literature specifically, and how contemporary literature uses um, genre fiction from the past and things like folk tales and fairy tales, um, those kind of conventions to make um, this, this, new, um, this new type of uncanny that I'm trying to coin as this term, the uncanny gastronomic. Um, so for me, it was really important for there to be some contemporary stories littered in there. But also it diversified the collection, like Johnny said, because um, it could have been, you know, strange tales of the cannibal weird. And, and that would have been really easy for, say, 18th, 19th century. Um, it, there were so many cannibal tales I could have looked at. There's only so many cannibal tales you want to read. <laughs> um, and I wanted to show that um, the Uncanny Gastronomic is more about that one facet and we can have the strangeness of going home and someone else is, you know, cooking in your house. Or um, the post story about, um, it, it's about teeth. And all, all of these kind of um, different ways we can think about how we engage with food and how food is something that um, shows how we engage with what's around us and ourselves. And I think that naturally, through different eras, that's explored in different ways. So it's helpful for it to have a, a time surprise there. I think we've all got the, you don't need to worry about the phrase not bedding down. We've all got the uncanny gastronomic in our heads now. We'll all be saying it endlessly, <laughs> I'm sure. Um, sticky hand up. Yes, a question there. And is there that one on the other, we got a mic coming there. Is the one on the other side of the room that we can have next? Okay. Hello, Hello. thanks very much, everyone. Um, you, you spoke earlier about uh, the, the uncanny as living in this sweet spot between the familiar and the unfamiliar what what role do you think that has in our psychology what's the what what's the reason for that i was i've been really struck by uh the reference in the gastronomic weird to um to the open mouth as this primordial image of of fear of consumption and being consumed and uh the role that might have played is perhaps more apparent but what what is the uncanny for if anything um, I think it would depend on the context of if the uncanny as, you know, for the weird as a whole or specifically for, um, you know, the edible weird. But for, for me, it's about um, the fact that the uncanny gastronomy, I started thinking about it when I realised 
name a fairy tale or a folk tale that doesn't have a food item at the centre, mm. that's not a kind of folk agent or some kind of magic helper Vladimir Prop called, called food and kind of categorised it in his folkloristic kind of, um, you know, categorisation. Um, it's, it, it's something that, that drives and is, is very present. And then I thought that is ultimately uncanny because it is, like I said earlier, how can anything be more mundane than food? Mm. Um, so the way that it's used for such interesting effects is that's what I'm trying to explore, is why are we doing that? And I think the uncanny is the best way to look through the lens of, of that, yeah. really. Have any of us read Freud's essay on the, unca on the uncanny recently, uh, enough recently. To, to answer, to answer, the, <laughs> answer the question? Well, I mean, I contributed to a, um, an anthology that by Comma Press um, called The New Uncanny, and, th and that was very much uh, a, an anthology that was geared around re-sort re of imagining um, Freud's theory of the uncanny for kind of modern, from modern readers. So and there were lots of things in that, that you know, doppelgangers, um, fear of dolls, uh, all, the, all these different kinds of, of fears that are kind of listed in this, in this essay by Freud. Um, and yeah, that's, uh, I suppose that was, it, it, it is that it's that sense of we've been discussing tonight of of something that is familiar, but there's just one element that, or yeah. whatever that element is, it's not always said, but something that just puts it off. You know, uncanny valley, that whole kind yes. of is. You know, there there is it's, it's a but there is a familiarity at its core, essentially, in order for it to kind of kick off that weird oddness. Or well, the idea of something that in a in a gothic story we might expect to find, you know, in a ruined castle or on a mm. on a middle European mountaintop somewhere in a recognisable domestic environment. That's mm. a sort of sort of category mixing. Yeah, category mixing. And I think also sort of with what you were saying about them, um, like doppelgangers and stuff like that, I think and the mouth and all that, I think there's also a sensation of the body and the self as somehow permeable and porous and oneself as a vulnerable thing that can be copied and imitated yeah. and taken out of context. And I think that there's, there's something in that as well. Is that what one of the appeals of this story, that it, it sort of it, it threatens the body of the reader in some ways, Tanya? Yeah, well, I think... Body horror is has become such a it's such a huge thing now, isn't it? Since mm. Clive Barker has kind of solidified that idea that it comes from this kind of older form of narrative. Yeah, yeah it's um, well, it really plays into into your collection as well. Yeah, I think uh, body horror is huge for me as a, a fan of body horror in particular yeah. because I think it's so interesting that we would want to watch that on mm. on the TV screen or read about that, and it, I think it's. Um, it's a weird um, kind of almost experimentation to consume that media. I mean, to pun, pun of using that word, but it's it's something that we get to experience that we could never have in real life. And I think that's the difference between something like the weird and the uncanny or cosmic horror, yeah. because cosmic horror is so you know out there, mm. but the bodily horror is something that's so. Yeah. close to home it, could, it couldn't be closer than something that threatens our own form yeah. mm. what would i don't know whether you've ever discussed it with him but what would garth Marenghi say about <laughs> uh, about body horror if we if he were here i would say it was you know yeah the most important <laughs> no, no, <laughs> the most important aspect it's interesting though what the when you were saying about the one of the oldest image the image of the, the open mouth and i do wonder whether that is something in that you know because I think one of the, the basic fears of any child is to be eaten mm. you know it's kind mm. of because everyone's sort of very big big mouth yes oh I could eat you up and that and I, I do think there's something very you know primal that that you learn very early on yes. that I'm small they're big yeah and they're gonna eat me <laughs> It's taken a turn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My, my favourite definition of the uncanny is what John Pertwee said about how it's, if you find a yeti on the Himalayas, it's not so frightening. If you find one sitting on the loo in Tooting Beck. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> we have another question. Don't be scared. Yes. I'll try this again, but is the one perhaps on the other side that we could set up so that... <sighs> <laughs> Uh, hello. You're playing with um, 
Oh, sorry, oh, go on. Sorry, this is just building on the previous points and the mention of Clive Barker. I was just wondering about your opinion about in how there seems to be such a relationship between horror, the weird and the erotic mm -hmm. and how there seems to be such a relationship between those two and also in reference to food and like the sensuality of food. We could go with fiction. this for a while, couldn't yeah. we, this one probably. Yeah. Well, not me. But... Oh, go on. <laughs> <laughs> We all just look at each other. <laughs> no, after you, after you. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, we've got, uh, as uh, the gentleman mentioned down there, we have a, an anthology called Doomed Romances that is all about a sort of uncanny love coming out um, in February where we're going to explore some of this yeah. material. I don't know how erotic it's going to get. I haven't read the stories yet, but um, <laughs> we'll see. Well, I think... Sorry. 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 Sorry, no, go ahead. No, no, you go. Um, I was just going to say about Freud, really. I mean, the, the kind of sex drive and the death drive are so twinned in that kind of um, idea of, you know, psychosexual development and all of that kind of thing. So I think um, from Freud's perspective, um, there is definitely the pinning of those things together in horror, naturally, maybe in its bodiliness. Um, and again, in, in the threat of permeability and kind of um, por the porosity of bodies um, naturally invokes some of those things. And, you know, in a lot of horror, um, the sexual and, and the horror are, are twins. So I think maybe that could be some of the reason why as well. Yeah, no, I completely agree. I mean, I think that there is a there is a coming together of horror and the erotic and sex in terms of taboo and the fact that everything about horror is knowing you shouldn't look and wanting to look anyway. And I think that there is there is a lot of um, juxtaposition in that sense. I think also that like because as we were saying before, horror is. Uh, community in its way and I think that there is there is quite a lot in how much horror is embraced by the queer community and how much it is to do with undergroundness and wanting to kind of I don't know um there's there's something I'm trying to phrase what I'm saying but there is something about wanting to be part of something which is private and yours and about that and communal at the same time I think there's there's an enormous of coming together of those two things. Do you think also horror can sometimes expert one of the things that horror is horrified by is is the erotic? You know, I think, think you know, MR James reading out, yeah. you know, telling the old Etonian schoolboys on Christmas Eve about uh, you know I, I feel I've used this phrase several times during this conversation, but those scary things that brush up against you in the night. Mm. I, th I think a huge number of ghost stories are written by sexually repressed writers. Yes. yes. I, yes. You know, really uh, uh, genuinely, that's <laughs> Yeah, that's where that kind of stuff comes from. I yeah. think, you know, Aikman yeah. as well. Yes. You know, yeah. but as readers, I mean, isn't there isn't there pain and agony and and self disgust wonderful? It's it's so <laughs> thrilling, isn't it? It's so exciting for us to read about. It's so rich and weird. Could be the role of catharsis as well. Like yeah, how that that links mm. the two as well. That that kind of cathartic energy. Yeah, and voyeurism. Yeah. Yeah. So it's all sex. Yeah. <laughs> I thought you'd go at all that a bit more aggressively. <laughs> there we are. It's We're British all one right at the back. Right at the back. <coughs> and the microphone is, is with you now. Hello. Um, so uh, lots of people say that horror sort of reflects the cultural anxieties of, of the time, um, both in terms of stories and in films as well. I was wondering, are there any stories that you've read or films that you've watched that have felt surprisingly modern? Um, because of the anxieties that they may Good question. Um, reflect. No, seems <laughs> like. <laughs> so getting everything I've ever read in yeah. my life. Or perhaps there's a kind of time. Are they are are these anxieties historically specific? Uh, was... Maybe they're maybe they're. They're, they're not so much. Yeah, I no, I think I was. This isn't. This isn't a great answer. Again, we're at the British Library. I'm talking about movies again. But um, <laughs> I we went to see a screening of Pender's Fen fairly. Oh recently, wow! And that felt Ooh. astonishingly modern for what it was. I mean, it's not that old comparatively, but do you know what I mean? It felt. It felt almost avant-garde in mm -hmm. what it was doing as well, and about its politics and about how the folklore aspects of it nonetheless felt like they could have been absolutely appropriate now. And yeah, I think it's, it's very weird when that happens because it feels a little bit like you're being watched in a strange way. I don't know, that was, that was definitely <coughs> a, a weird one for me. I would say Le, Le Fanu, I mean, we've mm. spoken about him before, but he, I would say he's a very modern ghost story yeah. writer. And it, it, it just feels very much that he's writing about neuroses, 
and you know our kind of modern in, our modern sense of what a psychological neurosis is you know um, but way before M.R. James or any of those kind of established ghost story writers came about. I wonder whether that sort of idea doesn't influence the anthologist, because you're looking back to stories from the 19th century and earlier in, in a post-Freudian world, but some of the qualities that we've identified come from Freud, don't they? Or the theory of it comes from Freud. So we, the anthologists might look back in the, into the past and these things stand out because they seem connected with that body of ideas that, with, with, which, which we've used to theorise horror and the uncanny. Yeah, I think the, the writer for me that is the most kind of self-consciously Freudian is May Sinclair, who I think is kind of maybe lesser known now. but um, Tell really, us about her. A really amazing uh, writer. So she is thought to have coined the term stream of consciousness, which I think is pretty important. Um, she wrote these kind of slightly psychologically tinged uh, stories. So there's... there's I, I can't, now I can't remember the name of any of them, but there's one. Where, give us the vibe. Give us the flavour. Um, this this couple have ha have had an affair, and then they end up kind of in hell, stuck with each other. Um, <laughs> and there's some kind of like an edge of kind of sexual morality to it that's actually quite terrifying and uh, horrendous. Um, yeah. Really I remember there's another one as well where there's some kind of strange almost like a, a kind of floating ectoplasm thing that, that follows her out of some um, garden path and into some... Uh, that's all I can remember about it. I yeah, can't remember what it was called, but it was just a very odd, creepy, <laughs> creepy story. And you couldn't say what it was. You know, it was no. pure stream of consciousness kind of, you know, yeah, <laughs> yes. odd. That seems like a very, you know, a materialised stream of consciousness, yeah. that idea of, <laughs> of ectoplasm that follows you. Yes, we've got another one from online, have we? Or is this coming from you? No. Oh, very good. You're a medium. You're working as a medium here. So what's coming through from the other side? Um, we have a question from Joseph. And um, they're asking about whether the themes that are explored as weird are also seen as weird to non-Western audiences. And I guess by extension, how much of what we're seeing as weird maybe in this room is through a European lens, through a British lens. There you go. It's <laughs> a great question. Yes. Yeah, I think is. probably a fairly large proportion of it. I think in some of the interesting experiments we've done is bringing translated fiction into some of the collections like the uh, Italo Calvino, and that one's set in Mexico as well, so it's sort of Written in Paris. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's all sorts going on there. Um, and Silvina. Acampo, I think, is the other one in that. Yes, yeah, Sabina Acampo, Franz Kafka. So it's, yeah. I mean, it tends to be still, you know, quite, quite Western in, yeah. that, in that sense. But um, it was important to me to, to look at different ways of viewing the, the weird through those lenses. Um, and I have particular interest in, you know, um, Latin American writing. So Sylvia Acampo was someone who I, I actually had to bring in. But, um, yeah, I think it's something that's important that, that we have to think about, especially when we think about... Um, who gets to speak and when in, in different eras. Mm -hmm. yeah. We have been, we've been, well, we're a very small team, so all of these <laughs> things may never happen, but I've been thinking about a sort of translated fiction subset um, series, and I've been talking to an editor in uh, Bangladesh about uh, translated Bangladeshi uh, fiction, mm -hmm. and he's talking about how a lot of that is in response to sort of colonial influence, and so you've got ghost stories, but that's the the backdrop and that is in answer to that question that would be a completely different set of yeah. kind of that's really interesting because it, it shows us really how our sense of particularly the ghost story is dominated by a very an english tradition is and an irish tradition too but kind of you know i, I suspect that you know a, a lot of the irish authors seem to be kind of accommodated within that tradition of the english ghost story don't they there is a kind of national culture element to this isn't there mm. Yeah. And does that tra those they're, they're quite ex they're quite kind of celebrated those traditions aren't they that yeah definitely and I think that comes back to one of the questions from earlier as well about the different time periods that we're plucking yeah. from so if we're going for more sort of late Victorian through to Edwardian it's more likely to be the British yeah. and Irish tradition but if we go further into the 20th century we encompass more American authors mm. which has a different kind of flavor to it yeah. in terms of just the society being so different the, the ways that 
Is Shirley Jackson American? I yeah. made that up? Yeah. yeah. So the Shirley Jackson story is a good <laughs> yeah. example of that, of that domestic setting is very different to us, but mm. comes with its own kind of uncanny trapping. Perhaps because, I mean, if we're, talk, cause we're, if we're talking about the Unheimlich, then the idea of home is really important. All these stories have to come from somewhere quite specific, don't they? To have their effects, and maybe we have to feel like we know what our home is within mm. them in order for their effects to work sometimes. Mm, a bit of hmm from the panel there. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we've got one right at the back. Oh, we've got two at the yeah. back, have we? That's great. I think we might have to come to an end <coughs> quite soon. But um. oh, thank you. Hiya, this one's for Johnny. Um, have you ever thought about doing a, an anthology about the new weird? So like Charlie Mavo, Jeff Vandermeer, that sort of thing. We've certainly thought about it, yeah. So, and it's another branch that we're exploring and possibly hoping to do at some point. Um, we've been doing some anthologies with Johnny Maines, who's done a few of those uh, sort of newer anthologies and is very excited to do something like that with us. Um, we're just trying to figure out, all, get all the pieces in place and make sure we can actually do it properly because it's quite a, it'll be quite a stepping stone from classic fiction publishing, which is our main uh, bread and butter at the moment. But yeah, we'd, we'd love to do it, I think. It'd be interesting, possibly even just like a yearly British Library's book of the new weird, not to crib on the new uncanny and all of the excess <laughs> stuff that Common Press is doing. He's the editor of Scotland the Weird, isn't he? Scotland the Strange. Scotland the Strange, sorry. That yeah. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. And Celtic yeah. Weird from because, last yes. year. Yeah. Johnny's a Herbert Van Fowl man. I mean, uh, <laughs> yes, he's yeah. a pan paperbacks man. <laughs> was, there another, was there another hand go up at the ad back? Yes, yes. Yes, hello. hello. Hi. Um, sorry to end on a sort of a quite a heavy note, but um, there seems to be obviously a kind of psychological factor intrinsically linked in the weird and horror and so on. Um, and I'm sort of brought to mind of Daniel Harms, kind of his absurdist writings. And it does make me wonder, is there kind of a philosophical thread that seems to run through horror that any of you have noticed? Is there a philosophy of horror? Is there an attitude or a... Lovecraft might have kind of said there was, <laughs> I suppose. Yes. You know. Um, problematic figure in many ways, <laughs> but I mean, uh, he had very firm views on the supernatural in literature, um, and and he was very, very kind of um, judgmental on who who was doing it well and who wasn't. But he did kick out some absolutely brilliant ones. I, I think he was, I don't think he liked. Uh, oh, I can't remember. Re Read the essay, I suppose, but it is, it's good because it gives you a good list of, of lots of writers. I mean, it was a, it's a very important essay for really one of the earliest ones, kind of pulling all these writers out that were doing a similar sort of thing and giving you a little reading list, really. But, it, but I suppose he had quite strong kind of nihilistic <laughs> philosophical views on, on, you know, what constituted cosmic horror for him, I guess. And... Um, but other than that, I, I don't know. Are there shared ideas, shared viewpoints that, that, that we, you'd read across stories or across traditions? I would come at it from the perspective of what philosophers have said about the emotional effect of horror. So um, things on kind of affect theory and Julia Kristeva's theory of the abject, um, ideas of, um, you know, um, sloughing off what is not of the body and kind of constituting what is the self and the other. Um, theories of what makes something grotesque, theories of um, what makes something, um, you know, just horrific or funny. And I think a lot of it is down to philosophizing around what makes us tick and what makes us feel weird. And I think a lot of that has been done by philosophers over time. And that can be, um, you know, it's not just in literary criticism, it, it's in pretty much across a lot of philosophy. And we can look at those things. I think that bridges the low high culture divide as well. We can